So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to talk about it, like at, at the end of the session, uh, talk okay. about our uh, future events. And if anybody is interested, we are always welcoming new people because this is a very small group of people trying to uh, organize this session. So any help would be much appreciated. So I'm going to talk about it at the end of the session, definitely. Thanks, Julie. No problem. Uh, so uh, let's start our session. Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to our monthly meeting of the ABEP Sub Boston chapter. Uh, today, we are going to have a session uh, addressing the updates to 223 uh, Massachusetts Energy Code. I'm going to briefly introduce our speaker uh, and hand it off to Patrick. As a director of sustainable design for Vanderwall Engineers, Patrick is leveraging his passion and experience in sustainable, integrated, and innovative building design to inform designs through rigorous energy and water analysis. Patrick's background as an architectural engineer with a focus on sustainable MEP systems informs his multidisciplinary and collaborative approach to building design. To building design, Patrick's career is highlighted by multiple awards, speaking at several conferences and his involvement and leadership in the design of multiple lead platinum, uh, net zero energy and net zero operational carbon projects. So uh, without further ado, I think if Patrick, you want to take over the screen and share your slides uh, and we'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sheila. And hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Uh, so. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you're probably all at least somewhat aware of the new uh, Massachusetts Energy Codes, which have just gone into effect. Um, we are certainly you know, diving through the codes ourselves. Uh, and I will say uh, that in my experience, uh, giving this presentation, I've collaborated with a number of other consulting engineers in town. We presented uh, an education session on Friday on behalf of the Boston Society of Architects that while uh, any of us, certainly myself included, uh, might be presenting these uh, things as if we're an authority on it, I want to assure you we are at best one step ahead. Uh, we're all learning this together. We're all gonna best learn these new codes uh, you know, collectively and through our work. Um, but that said, you know, I, I certainly welcome the questions as they come up, certainly uh, include them in uh, the chat. I do want to also uh, acknowledge if anyone here is looking for an AIA learning unit, um, continuing education credit, uh, certainly let us know in the chat and we can arrange that. This, this presentation is eligible for AIA continuing education credit. Um, so with that, uh, hi, I'm Patrick Murphy. I lead uh, the sustainable uh, design practice at Vanderweil Engineers uh, based now here in Boston. Our uh, agenda today will be First, to go through some context of the energy and carbon regulatory kind of frameworks in Massachusetts and what are informing these uh, energy code updates. Then uh, we'll go through the new energy code compliance paths with a specific focus on the stretch code, the updates to the Massachusetts stretch code and uh, its uh, amendments. And then uh, also briefly touch on the specialized opt-in code, which is a new layer of the code. It's almost like a super stretch code. Uh, and then talk through some takeaways at the end. So first, the, the context for these updates to the code uh, is something I think we've all been seeing over the last several years, a clear trend towards decarbonization and more stringent uh, energy performance on projects. So first, uh, the Massachusetts uh, state uh, government uh, passed a climate law uh, a year ago that enabled a new update to the energy code. Uh, this new energy code applies to the entire state uh, and is a pretty significant update. That's what we'll talk about mostly today. But in addition to the code, within Boston, we have the updates to Birdo uh, in the last year or two, uh, going from an energy reporting disclosure ordinance to an emissions reduction disclosure ordinance, uh, and Cambridge is hot on its heels. This is focusing on reducing the carbon footprint of existing buildings, since existing buildings contribute about three quarters of the emissions in the city. Next, 
is the Article 37 process. So for those of you working on large projects in the city of Boston, the city is currently going through a process of updating Article 37's requirements and the draft language as I most recently saw it is to functionally require net zero operation day one. That certainly includes an allowance of a healthy allowance for offsite renewable energy, but the city is using its entitlement authority uh, and zoning authority to um, drive projects towards net zero and to electrify it to the extent possible. And then lastly, uh, last spring, uh, Governor Baker signed a new Massachusetts climate policy into effect. And it had a number of provisions that were focused at state level uh, utility and renewables, but uh, more specifically for this, this group, it created a pilot program for a fossil fuel ban for up to 10 communities that will go into effect next year. The list of those 10 communities isn't, as I understand it, totally set. There's some jockeying of which uh, cities uh, or communities will make that list, uh, but there will be a pilot program for a fossil fuel ban and new construction. And similar to how Boston about a decade ago instituted the first version of Birdo, which was that energy reporting uh, requirement for large buildings, now the state is creating a program similar. We've seen where this is headed in Boston, in New York City, in Washington, DC, where these initial uh, reporting requirements eventually create the data set for a uh, next stage of doing something with that data to reduce the emissions and energy use of existing buildings. I'm speculating here, but I suspect that's where the state is ultimately headed on a, on a statewide basis for large buildings. So that context um, you know, maps out across the state in different combinations. So we have to be careful as um, you know, analysts and design professionals about the context of the project, uh, the jurisdiction that it's being designed in, certainly you know, within Massachusetts, but then even more specifically, is it subject to, especially in Boston and Cambridge, some you know, fairly stringent uh, an analysis and performance requirements. But beyond that, especially uh, in the immediate surrounding communities, these additional policies, the list of 10 towns uh, and municipalities that we suspect are uh, on the list for that uh, potential uh, spot on the, the fossil fuel ban are listed here in orange. Um, again, that's not a given yet, but you know we're headed in that direction. Um, and we're just seeing a, a number of these different policies are layered on community by community. And so you have to kind of make sure that you're identifying the right pathways uh, for compliance for your project based on its location. And I do want to emphasize that because some of these policies are focused on new construction, some of them are focused on uh, long-term building ownership. Every building we design, every building we analyze today is going to become an existing building. So it is, in my opinion, our responsibility to look at the big picture of the lifespan of the building and its operation and guide our clients, our owners, um, you know, around those risks for those existing building regulations in addition to all these energy code updates. But having said all of that context, uh, clearly there's a push for significant energy improvement in buildings, significant decarbonization in buildings. And to that end, the state has significantly updated its stretch code. So the pathways now, there are three primary pathways. The first is the regular energy code. This is functionally referencing the IECC of 2021, which references ASHRAE 90.1 2019, plus the Massachusetts amendments, which include things like uh, what was formerly known as the three out of 10. That applies to a smaller and smaller number of projects, it seems. Um, in fact, it's probably not going to be very likely that you have a lot of projects that follow this path. Instead, the stretch code, which we have historically known as applying to new, to new construction, to large new construction projects, and um, that were used to require a 10% reduction in energy use, in site energy, compared to the ASHRAE 90.1 baseline, now is applying to smaller buildings, and I'll get into that more. It applies to renovations and alterations, and it provides five different pathways for compliance, which I'll go through each of those pathways a little bit later in the presentation. Then finally, there's, the, uh, I'm sorry, the stretch code adoption. So 
what you're seeing here is the map of communities that have adopted the stretch code in Massachusetts, all in orange. So basically, the vast majority of the state, approximately 90% of the population or more, has is living in a community that has adopted the stretch code. The way that this stretch code update is written, that any of these communities that have already adopted the stretch code are automatically enrolled in the new stretch code. So the stretch code applies right off the bat to all these communities. But in addition to the stretch code, similar to how all these communities had to opt in at one point over the, the last several years to adopt the stretch code, there is a new specialized opt-in code. The specialized opt-in code is almost, like I said, like a super stretch code. It is for the more ambitious communities to help drive projects towards net zero right away through the codes. The timeline for the implementation of this. So we are somewhere here uh, in the very beginning of 2022. We've already gone through the final uh, finalization of the code language. It is publicly available on the state's website. A uh, simple Google search for Massachusetts Energy Code Update. You will find the DOER's website with all the applicable language, red lines, resources, technical guides, etc. That official language review and adoption policy is closed. We are still in a, in a period of time where the technical guidance by the state is in a review period. So for those of you that are, have already taken a look at that, there's a chance to give feedback. But now that we're in the first half of 2023, projects that we're designing now are going to have to make a choice. Are they going to be able to permit ahead of July 1, 2023? If so, they can permit under the existing energy code. If those projects will permit on July 1 or later, they will be subject to all these new code updates on the energy code. That July 1 date, it is uh, before and an after. There is no concurrence period. There is not a choice between them. Uh, it's a matter of when you submit the permit documentation. Concurrency periods were um, ruled as not uh, permissible uh, by then Attorney General Maura Healy, now, now the governor, um, you know, in the last year or so. Before July 1st, like if you take nothing else out of this presentation, before July 1st, current codes, after July 1st, new codes. But we also want to monitor beyond after July 1st that in the second half of 2023 and into 2024, those individual communities that are adopting that specialized opt-in code will have to keep track of that because you'll see on a rolling basis more and more communities adopting it. And it will go into effect uh, at different times throughout uh, the next several years, which I'll get to in more detail later. So that's the overview of the new code, but let's dive into the stretch code pathways because that's really going to be, I think, the primary uh, system that we have to analyze our projects for energy code compliance for most of our of, of our projects. So the five pathways are a prescriptive pathway, a targeted performance pathway, which is new, a relative performance pathway, which I think we all are very familiar with, but there are some updates to it, a passive house pathway, and I saw somebody chime in that they're uh, with passive house, so uh, they're about to see a lot more work, and then uh, lastly, a hers rating pathway. So the first pathway is a um, prescriptive pathway. This is available for small projects under 20,000 square feet. Um, and for other certain specific scenarios, um, say like just the uh, adjustment to an existing assembly of a, a limited scope project, that basically requires following the IECC plus the Massachusetts amendments. Relatively straightforward, but it has to be a very limited scope project for this to apply. The targeted performance is a new pathway, and I am interested in your all feedback for those of you that have looked at this so far. What this is, is a new metric uh, that essentially creates a, a, a cap on the amount of peak thermal energy demand in both heating and cooling. The metric is called a TEDI, 
thermal energy demand intensity, the amount of uh, heating or cooling in BTUs per square foot required. It is a different set point or a different uh, limit based on the type of project and the scale of the project. Every consulting engineer, every energy modeler that I've talked to in town is skeptical, especially about these being able to hit these heating Teddy numbers. Um, that said, the methodology for how to do the calculations, the, the modeling to uh, document the Teddy compliance is in the new guidance from the state that was published in the last couple of weeks. Um, there is very specific criteria for the energy model inputs, the schedules, things like that to use in this scenario so that you're uh, aligning with the state's expectations. So I suspect we'll see more uh, projects that are actually going through that process using that state guidance and vetting out the, um, the ability of projects to earn these numbers. But uh, generally speaking, uh, the feedback that a lot of uh, design professionals provided to the DOER on last Friday's presentation by the BSA there was a lot of skepticism around the ability to achieve these numbers without effectively going to passive house levels of uh, building envelope performance. Uh, although I think it's to be seen as more product teams actually do the modeling and validate this pathway as an option. This is intended to be for commercial types of projects, schools, and, and there's an option for multifamily in the initial uh, period of time. Now, the next pathway, this is the one that we're, I think, probably all the most familiar with, and this is relative performance. But one of the key changes is uh, something that was updated in ASHRAE 90.1 back in 2016, which is a focus on regulated energy. So you're all probably very familiar that regulated energy is basically the energy for heating, cooling, lighting, et cetera, that we as design professionals have more control over. Unregulated energy is the energy, the miscellaneous plug loads and miscellaneous equipment loads that we have less uh, control over. And the relative performance uh, pathway is in Massachusetts energy focus, not energy cost. That's an important deviation from ASHRAE 90.1, an amendment in the state's laws. Um, but you have to show effectively uh, a significant performance energy index uh, below the baseline. So it depends on the type of occupancy or the type of, of building you have. So a hospital, or, or we believe hospital equals labs in the new code, um, needs to show roughly a 40, 41% reduction in regulated energy compared to the baseline. As a general concept, we could have an entire presentation just about how to, how to calculate this. Um, and I suspect that I'm in a crowd that probably even knows it better than I do. Other types of projects, uh, occupancies have to be more aggressive with their energy reduction compared to that baseline. So this is a significant improvement in performance compared to the baseline. Excuse me. We have run one example project through this, a speculative lab office building. Um, we're seeing these pop up all over the city. I'm sure you're working on a number of them yourselves. Under the ninth edition of the Massachusetts Energy Code, so the, you know, the previous version or the version that's still in effect through uh, July 1 this year, we are projecting 35% energy savings. Under the new energy code, we're projecting 11% energy savings. That's a pretty dramatic swing. Um, and that's to say nothing of all the other amendments to the, um, to the code just the relative performance pathway, the, the percent savings, we saw a pretty substantial swing. These are labs that include some fairly robust uh, energy recovery systems and efficiency measures, but uh, you know, we are seeing a, a pretty substantial shift. So things that might have, energy conservation measures that might have been considered a uh, nice to have or just a, an improvement on uh, the design whether to earn lead points or to, to do the right thing or reduce energy costs, now are basically becoming necessary to achieve enough savings to demonstrate compliance with this. 
I do want to note that uh, a number of the other consulting engineers that I've talked to in town and energy modelers, uh, we all are aligned that the new stretch code has done away with the 10% minimum savings requirement that used to be in the stretch code. Now, even though this project is showing 11% savings, you know, it, it didn't have to hit 10% savings. It had to hit, you know, any amount of savings of energy savings to comply with the code. Um, so that is an important change. The, the baseline got a lot more, or the amount of savings that we have to show, um, or the baseline got a lot more aggressive, but we don't have to show at least 10% savings on top of an already aggressive baseline, if that makes sense. The next pathway is passive house. And this is requiring passive house pre-certification uh, using, as we understand it, either of the versions of passive house. Um, and so certainly a substantial focus on building envelope performance, not just the insulation, um, but also more or less defaulting into triple pane glazing. And really in all these pathways, we're seeing triple pane glazing is gonna become the norm um, in a lot of projects. This is also certainly focused on air tightness and on thermal bridging. And then for the mechanical systems inside, maximizing energy recovery, all electric systems with high efficiency. The last uh, pathway is a Hurge rating, which might be applicable for some uh, multifamily projects, although quite frankly, Passive House seems like the more straightforward approach and hers ratings are not going to be a permissible pathway for Passive House projects under the uh, specialized opt-in code anyway. But uh, if you did pursue a hers rating for a project, it is a pretty substantial uh, you know, decrease in the HERS rating for different types of projects after uh, mid-year of next year. Um, so we're looking at, you know, a kind of dynamic uh, phase in of the applicability and the targets for uh, performance for, especially for residential types of, of occupancies over the course of the next year or two. So those are the pathways. Um, but in addition, there are a number of amendments to the stretch code that are just mandatory provisions, things that have to be incorporated into the design. I'll go through them kind of one by one. Um, and this isn't even a total list uh, of all of them that are in there, but these are the ones that we thought were the most important. So the first is the applic applicability of the stretch code. So it no longer applies only to new construction. It now can apply to alterations of existing buildings. It applies to additions. It applies to new buildings at the 20,000 square foot threshold or up. So I think it was 100,000 square feet before, now it's 20,000 square feet. So it applies to many more buildings. The additions I wanna acknowledge, if you had a 5,000 square foot building and you wanted to add a 20,000 square foot addition to it, it would have to follow the stretch code. You can't get away with, um, you know, having a, an addition on a small building. If the addition is equal to or larger than this, the existing building up to 20,000 square feet, it also has to comply with the stretch code. If the addition is over 20,000 square feet, it just automatically has to comply with the new stretch code, no matter how big the existing building is. One thing I want to acknowledge also in the changes here is that when it comes to alterations of existing buildings, there is a little bit of forgiveness in the envelope requirements that we have to model. Basically, we can model the existing, uh, I'm sorry, we can model the, the envelope as 10% worse performing than the prescriptive code values. This is not the same as what it used to be where an existing assembly would be existing to remain um, and it's existing poor performance would be in the model. Now, as we understand it, you have to increase that baseline. So basically it's, it's forcing in a lot of situations, improvements to existing building envelopes, even if you're not necessarily touching those envelopes. The next is mandatory electrification requirements. So, a lab or healthcare project, uh, what is in the code defined as a quote unquote high ventilation building, which is a half a CFM of outside air or more per square foot, must electrify 25% of its peak space heating and ventilation heating load 
through an air source heat pump, a ground source heat pump, or an exhaust source heat pump. Air source and ground source are pretty straightforward uh, types of heat pump. Exhaust source heat pump is uh, more or less, it's, it's a reference to a conductive type system, but I think there's some other creative ways of uh, capturing enough energy with that system um, that's not proprietary. 25% of peak space means 25%, and it's defined as, as the 99.6 design condition, which in Boston is seven degrees. So this is a really substantial uh, amount of mandatory electrification of uh, lab heating loads. Um, and that's around capacity, not around annual fossil fuel consumption or anything like that, it's peak capacity. For buildings other than labs, if they have more than 50% glazing, they also have to electrify 100% of their peak space heating and ventilation heating through those three same systems at that peak condition. So, excuse me, the amount of projects that we all see that have relatively high uh, window to wall ratios those are going to be uh, forced into full electrification. Uh, I would not be surprised to see a number of projects that are at 49% window to wall ratio. Um, and I do wanna acknowledge that this also applies to spandrel areas, curtain wall assemblies. Even if it's opaque, it is still a, a glazing assembly and that triggers this, which leads me to envelope requirements. So, you're probably familiar with the envelope backstop calculation. Um, this is setting an overall UA value for the thermal envelope performance. Uh, it functionally uh, is requiring triple pane glazing, uh, although not specifically saying it must be triple pane. Uh, there is a difference in the target value that you need to achieve based on whether your building is above or below that 50% glazed wall system threshold. If you have a glazed system, more like punched windows, um, and that adds up to less than 50% of the wall area, the overall assembly, or overall uh, building UA value that we're trying to achieve, or the U value that we're trying to achieve on average is a 0.1285. If you have a building that has glazed wall system, so think curtain walls, and that includes spandrels. The overall performance of the building uh, U-value on average would be a 0.16, really aggressive number. And additionally, there is a glazing system U-value maximum of 0.25. So I think we've all seen plenty of examples of double pane glazing that have U-value assembly U-values or I'm sorry, center of glass U values of like 0.27 to 0.3 and, and above. To hit a 0.25 assembly U value, you're functionally requiring triple pane glazing, maybe some vacuum sealed um, glazing double pane options might get you there, but I think this is what's gonna trigger us seeing a lot more triple pane glazing on projects. So, we are recommending, and I hope uh, you will all echo this, uh, that design teams do their envelope backstop calculations as early as possible um, and validate their envelope compliance at the same time that we as energy analysts are all um, doing our energy modeling to document performance within one of those stretch code pathways. What we're generally finding is that for projects that are at about a third of the wall area is windows or more, you are almost by default going to need to use triple pane glazing. It's a good place to start, but you still need to do that backstop calculation. Then in addition to that, there are air leakage requirements. And uh, this requires basically a blower door test on uh, the construction. And for our larger buildings, uh, you can test representative areas. This is an example of a project that is an addition to a historic building. Uh, we have 
you know, the complication around existing new highly glazed or, or lower glazed. Um, so we pushed the design team to do their envelope backstop calculation. That's what you see in the bottom. It got really detailed um, really quickly with all the different assemblies. And in the end, you know, they were documenting compliance. We pushed them to do this during schematic design for a couple of reasons. One, the cost of the project overall, like every project we're probably all working on these days, um, costs are high, owners are very first cost sensitive, and this owner needed to understand the total scope and cost of the project to comply with code. If the team had not done their due diligence in schematic design and documented in the schematic design set for pricing what it was going to take to comply with this new energy code, we were setting up this scenario where the owner might not appreciate how expensive the project might need to be. And you'd go through the value engineering process only to be surprised down the road when the team finally does its due diligence. So we are recommending to pull this forward. We are also recommending that design teams do this analysis as early as possible, if for no other reason than to not get everyone's hearts set around a very high glazing ratio. Um, or if they're going to do that, that they understand what it takes, what uh, you know, selections for materials and performance that they need to make to enable that high window to wall ratio. Um, you know, the idea being if you show a rendering of this project to an owner and the whole team gets their heart set on it, and then you eventually find out down the road that by doing your due diligence, you're not going to be in compliance or it's going to be significantly more complex or expensive to comply. That's something that we're really advising teams to figure out up front so that we're minimizing surprises down the road. Moving on, the additional energy efficiency requirements, um, which was in section C406 before, it was what was formerly known as the three out of 10 rule, has changed pretty substantially. A lot of the changes are because of the IECC changes. Um, so they have shifted from just picking three out of a list of 10, now to a points-based system. Some strategies are more valuable than others, and you need to accumulate enough strategies with enough points that gets you to 15 points. Massachusetts has gone further by amending the IECC table to eliminate any strategy that is fossil fuel-based. So the 5% or 10% heating efficiency improvement or the efficient fossil fuel water heater option, you don't get credit for that. They're not trying to incentivize the use of fossil fuels. On the flip side, they've added to this list, they've added a renewable space heating option that gets you 15 points. So there you go. You've satisfied this requirement by providing renewable space heating, basically a heat pump. Interestingly, and this is not an energy provision, they have also added a heavy timber construction option. So this gives you eight points, and this is meant to incentivize the adoption of heavy timber as part of the focus, uh, the growing focus on embodied carbon in addition to the operational carbon that we all focus on uh, every day. Next, energy recovery requirements are getting more stringent. So for non-high ventilation buildings, non-labs, non-healthcare projects, you need to have at least 75% effective energy recovery. And for multifamily projects and, and hotel projects, the outside air must be delivered directly to the space. Um, you can't rely on transfer of outside air in, um, things like that. For labs and healthcare projects, you can do an area weight, I'm sorry, a CFM weighted uh, average of the overall effectiveness of your, uh, your energy recovery. Because of the hazardous exhaust, you don't have to do 75% effective energy recovery on your hazardous lab exhaust. You can use 50% there and 75% on your non-hazardous exhaust. <clears throat> Next, this is a provision that was already in the code but uh, before, but I just want to make sure everyone uh, is aware of it, is the mandatory solar readiness requirement. This applies to buildings five stories in, few, uh, in height or fewer. And it requires of the available roof area, after you back out skylights, mechanical space, rooftop amenities, et cetera, 
and you back out the area that's shaded by uh, you know 70 uh, percent of the year or less that remaining area you need to provide 40 percent of that roof area for future pv and you need to provide area for future energy storage um, i advise project teams not to take this lightly as like yeah we have a roof and the structural engineer said it could support pv actually go through the exercise of marking out on the architecture roof plans and on the MEP plans where that PV ready zone is to protect it. So that when inevitably something changes in construction or somebody tries to add a fan or a roof vent or whatever it is that, you know, there's a no-go zone that's documented on the drawings. Then lastly, there's electric vehicle charging requirements. So in, the new code, it requires 20% of parking spaces in residential and business occupancies to be future EV charging ready. And all of all other project types, 10% have to have EV charging. Um, and that's nothing compared to projects in the city of Boston that require 25% of electric vehicle charging day one and the other 75% in the future. Uh, that said, this does not require every single parking space to be able to charge at full capacity all at the same time. Uh, there are provisions for an automatic load management system that these electric vehicle chargers can provide. And for an energy modeling crowd, this is something that is excluded, needs to be separately metered and not included in the performance of our models. Um, we want you know building owners and, and residents to use this, this um, this amenity, but it shouldn't be reflective of the performance of the building. So that was a lot. That was the stretch code that's going to apply to most of our projects, all those communities in orange that we saw on the map. But then there's also this specialized opt-in code on top of that. So the specialized opt-in code has to, just like the old stretch code was, has to be adopted community by community. Once it is adopted by each community, it has to have at least six months until it goes into effect. So for example, Watertown and Brookline, just I think a week or two ago, approved the new specialized opt-in code. So they did that in January. The next opportunity for it to go into effect won't be July 1st, it will be January 1st, 2024. And the reason is you have to have at least six months and then it's the next July 1st or January 1st. So we're gonna see communities uh, adopting this over the course of the next year plus. Um, it's really a matter of when these communities meet uh, and are able to vote on these types of things. Um, so some will have a, a more frequent meeting basis, some have you know one meeting a year. So we'll see that over time, uh, but there's at least a, a period of time where you should be aware um, but it, when it's coming down the pike and your project team can plan accordingly. Within the specialized opt-in code, uh, there is a requirement to use Passive House for multifamily projects um, starting in January 1 of 2024 uh, for projects six stories and higher. And then, um, for all other types of buildings, there are uh, zero energy building. You have to comply with one of these pathways, a zero energy building pathway, a mixed fuel building pathway, or an all electric building pathway, um, which functionally is going to require passive house and all electric heating um, for the all electric uh, buildings pathway. So it's a de facto fossil fuel ban for building heating um, within this pathway. There is a pathway for mixed fuel buildings. Um, I will admit, because this is at least a year out, uh, my personal attention has been much more on the stretch code, which is going to, into effect for buildings that are permitting in uh, the second half of this year. At, the, at best, these projects uh, under the new special adoption code will be permitting starting in 2024. So takeaways from all that. It was really dense. Um, thank you for following. So we really encourage project teams to discuss their code compliance options early. Identify the pathway or pathways that are most viable for the project. 
at this point, hopefully you know whether your project is permitting before or after July 1st, but that's a really important date uh, and will inform all of your decisions thereafter. Validate your plan for compliance early. Ideally in schematic design, but no later than the end of design development, you, your team should have done the energy modeling, done the backstop calculations, run through the stretch code amendments, and made sure all of that scope is incorporated into the design and that the results of the calculations are demonstrated compliance. The reason I say this is to minimize surprises down the road. If we wait to do this validation until shortly before submitting for permit, we're setting our projects up for potential failure uh, and the timing of issuing documents for permits is really you know, important for the, the overall project schedule. And you just don't want that kind of attention on, on the energy model results or you don't wanna to have to make changes to the design uh, late in the game with surprising costs and extra effort for the design team. So do the analysis early. And then lastly, electrify, electrify, electrify. Use heat pumps as much as you can, um, especially if you're in, in Boston or Cambridge, especially if your building is over 50% window to wall ratio, especially if you have a lab project, hit that 25% threshold, especially if you think you're gonna be in a community that's going to adopt the specialized opt-in code. Electrify everything, as, or at least as much as you possibly can. So with that, Here's my contact information. Um, and certainly if you have other questions, you can reach out to me through Sheeta. Um, I'll leave that up for a second and then we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Patrick, for putting this together and for very interesting presentation. So please ask uh, your questions. And I think there were a bunch in the chat. Maybe yes. if you want to monitor. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can uh, first ask those questions. Uh, one of the participants asks uh, whether the presentation is also qualified for ASHRAE PDH. It is not, unfortunately. OK. <laughs> then the next question was uh, about the um, PV on the roof. So. Uh, they are asking, uh, does that also require the roofs of mechanical paint penthouses to support PV? If that roof meets all the other qualifications, so it's not shaded, if there's not equipment up there, if it's not used as an amenity, et cetera, et cetera, then yeah, that roof would, would qualify as a roof among your overall roof area. Um, if you're, and, but remember, this is applicable if your building is five stories in height or lower. The penthouse doesn't count as a story. Great. And also, uh, Chris, Chris mentioning that if any uh, modelers on here have tried uh, TEDI calculation to see if they were basically successful <laughs> on hitting the thresholds. Yeah, let, let me jump in on that and, and add to it. So there is um, the draft guidelines, as you mentioned, Patrick, that are out. And there's still public comment available on that until February 2nd. And there actually are groups asking for them to extend the comment deadlines that some modelers can do the work. But what we're seeing is that uh, projects don't, very low energy projects don't seem to be complying with the TEDIs. And that the guidelines that they provided are, um, uh, are very difficult, let's say. So I'm really interested in what other modelers have, have seen. I've talked to a few folks, but I haven't heard from others like, like Patrick and, and the folks at, at Vanderweil and, and Eric, for that matter, I haven't heard from you on that one either. We have admittedly not run it through the latest guidance from the state um, to see if that makes a difference. Our analysis before that was not looking promising. Yeah. Well, I know we looked at the, the project we did together at Ashland, we looked at that. And despite having getting UI below 25, that doesn't meet the requirements. And, um, and and so people are trying desperately to model with the new guidance, but I don't know that anybody's actually done that work yet. The one silver lining on it that I saw is that the diversity factors and the schedules they give you assume a really high nighttime unoccupied load on your in pretty high plug loads. So that's how the building's going to be is going to be heated in the uh, in that Teddy analysis. 
Yeah, that's that's what we saw too, but nobody's actually run the numbers. So we're all hoping that once you put those in, and then that begs the question, why are we running loads that aren't the real loads in buildings at all? Why, why do that? They're also internally inconsistent because you're supposed to be doing lots of things to reduce that unoccupied load. Yeah. We, like, I mean, when, when Teddy was first contemplated, the idea was we would just take our proposed case model and just get the Teddy out of our proposed case model. And now instead with the guidelines, it's a complete throwaway model that is just going to set weird expectations for clients. It, it's a disaster. That's my two cents. I, I think the harder thing is, is, yeah, there's the backstop calculation. That's really easy to do relative to the Teddy modeling. I don't think you even need to do the backstop calculation if you do the Teddy modeling based on my reading of the code. But, but, well, you're not going to pass the Teddy if you don't pass the backstop. I mean, I think. Right. But the thing is, is that you have to do that backstop calculation based on some preliminary glazing layout and I, I'm still used to doing lots of eQuest modeling, and that is not the most nimble, <laughs> not the most nimble tool for that sort of thing. So I definitely need to get some some better early design tools under my belt. But that's what jumped out to me is that the workflow is going to be a lot different, where you can no longer have an architect expressing their their artistic talent. <laughs> in a vacuum, which is probably good that they don't do that anymore. But yeah, we're definitely going to need to be like on the hook for doing early rapid modeling early on to uh, to do this. We, um, I, Al, not from Boston, and <laughs> uh, but I'm with Theus. And when we saw the Teddy stuff come out, uh, we've been involved a little bit in that stretch code, obviously. Um, and we tried to replicate those Teddy results in Wolfie Passive, the tool we use for all of our certification, which is the same calculation protocol and methodology as the PHPP, which is what I believe uh, was used to help design these Teddies. And we haven't been able to reproduce them um, and anything that we tried to set up to reproduce a Teddy uh, number and that following that guidance was significantly over insulated, even based on like our targets. So I'm, I was, I came to this very curious to see what other people were experiencing in other tools as well. What size of a building were you modeling? Were we were modeling the, the uh, core? no, just the, the, the test cases that they had shown um, on that first release of the document, they gave a whole input summary of what they did. And it looked like uh, sort of like the DOE prototype, small office building. And then there was another um Another one that was a small core and shell thing as well, but a couple different use types, and we just we couldn't we couldn't come back to those heating numbers. Because you can you can hit them if you got a big enough core. If you yeah. got a city block size building that's you know a big cube, you can yeah yeah maximize your uh, <laughs> your volume floor area to wall ratio. But you know what's that for the occupants in terms of well being and daylighting and stuff like that? Right. I will say um, one of the outcomes of the initial BSA presentation on Friday, uh, it was intended to be the beginning of a series. And the first thing that a lot of people raise their hand as being interested in is a Teddy specific presentation with the DOER uh, so that we all can understand better their intent there and the methodology and what the realistic expectations are. Well, that, that sounds good. Sign me up for that. I want to hear that. Be, be on the lookout from the BSA. It's still, I mean, it was just an idea that was thrown out there and there's interest in it, but there hasn't been any follow through yet. I mean, it's only been a business yeah. day, but. So, so several of us are, are actually on a committee that the OER put together and have been talking to them about this. And I think what we need to hear from is the people who did the analysis, which is Stephen Winter. I don't know if anybody from Stephen Winter is on the, the line here. But, but they actually did the, the calculations to calculate the teddies. And I'd love to hear them explain what they did because they're normally pretty smart people. And I'd be surprised that they made something as difficult as we think it is. I will also echo Chris, um, your sentiment in the chat that just from like a energy modeling, like business and workflow perspective, the idea of a throwaway model is 
frustrating um, that it's like it's yet another uh, you know role or responsibility that the modelers have to to provide. Which you know I think we're all happy to to support our projects, but at some point, like it just doesn't feel like we're doing as much productive help. Yeah, on our it's, it's the models. energy modelers, uh, you know, uh, full employment uh, program, but. Our, our clients ultimately are going to get tired of this. And the thing I always frustrates me, you know, I I want to see strong codes, but if they have just ridiculous amounts of, of wasted time and effort, then it makes it very easy for the people who don't want strong codes to fight them. I, I want to give them no in, ammunition at all. I, I want to just have airtight, simple codes. Yep. Just a hypothetical theoretical question. Um, could thermal storage be used to meet those tennies? You can't use any kind of heat, like heat pump heat recovery. You can't, it's it's weird. It's like they, they take into account air side heat recovery, but you can't do hydronic heat recovery. As yeah. part you couldn't have like a water tank storing up hot water for use. It's, later. it's basically supposed to be independent of HVAC systems, except that oh, okay. it's not Thanks. because of uh, the ventilation. Uh, energy recovery and ventilation and then the standards are 20 pages long to deal with fan heat which is just silly <laughs> so specifying the mechanical system for something that's supposed to be system independent APDA went on this they, they tried to get get design teams to do a um, to do a passive house analysis on their projects and why aren't you meeting passive house like three years ago or so, and they stopped. They stopped asking for that after about six months. Or they, there was a window there where they're trying to get free, free consulting through projects, and um, it just didn't seem realistic. And so it's interesting that it jumped. It jumped into the code. I had a question about uh, about the psi and chi factors uh, for for the thermal bridging that are required. I know that that passive house does this all the time, and that's what you got. You know, it's easy to do on a single home residence or something like that. Um, has anybody done this successfully within? Uh, I know Design Builder has some inputs that you can put in, but actually determining what those values should be. Is there? Um, does anybody know of any good resources? that to explain how to do that other than just looking up something typical i mean they the the code references using um uh out there in pacific northwest um bc hydro's guide but i've used bc hydro's guide for a while and it's not exactly exhaustive um i'll put a link in the chat i think but we have a spreadsheet that we use that has all of like the protocol to calculate a psi value mm -hmm. um and you end up having to do two or three different therm models uh on a detail and then you can use that to calculate that psi value and then when it comes to actually inputting it into like a modeling tool like design builder energy plus there is um there most of those don't have a specific spot to input it so then it comes to the factory you have to include either like a thin strip of a surface or something like that and include that reduced um that reduced joint because you're trying to catch the joint between typically mm -hmm. like two different assemblies is where we'd see a thermal bridge but there's there's a you know it doesn't you can use um any of those other tools like heat flux flixo or heat flux 2D or 3D or something, which are paid tools, or if you want to use the um, good old therm, that works just mm -hmm. fine. Does it actually make that big of a difference if you have continuous insulation? When, if it's a big enough thermal bridge and there's enough of it happening, mm -hmm. so um, on the on like a, even like a large multifamily, a perimeter detail, uh, especially could be tough to insulate well, and we'll we'll see that make or break project sometimes. Hmm. Okay, everyone. If uh, there are any questions we can address, please let us know. Otherwise, I would like to thank again our presenter, Patrick, and everybody for being part of today.
uh, session. And also, I did want to highlight that Ibeb Sabas and uh, DOS have future uh, events coming. Coming, so please share with us your ideas for our future sessions. If there are any specific topics that you are interested in, please uh, reach out to us so we can plan our uh, future meetings in a way that best suits your interests. Uh, for example, we are going to do case study presentations. So if there are interesting projects that you want to share with us, please email us and uh, we are going to consider that. And also, if you uh, like to volunteer, we are always looking for more people to help organize these sessions. We are a very small group of people who has been doing this for a while. So any help would be uh, much appreciated. So please, again, reach out to us. You can see our uh, email address on the screen. Uh, and uh, we can like, uh, we would be happy to include you in our uh, planning sessions and figure out what to do next. So thank you all for your attending. Uh, we can uh, stick around for as long as people, uh, they want to answer questions, but I think we are done for now. Thank you hey, so guys, much. Put in a, a special sure. plug. We've got, you know, Bibs of Boston has been around for a year and uh, for a while in various incarnations. And there are a few folks on here who uh, were involved a lot in the past, and we would love to chat with you and figure out if you have any ideas and Maybe you want to get involved or have some other people or maybe some students, Holly, who would want to get involved. Um, we would we would love to uh, to hear about that because, uh, uh, you know, I think that the organization has a lot of um, a lot of a lot we can offer to our community. And it's great to, to get us together. And I don't know any other place that this happens. That was the original goal. <laughs> yeah, well, it's well, good we to started start 12, 13 years ago, whatever. Yeah, we still somehow have a web page that um, uh, somebody else was editing that we can't change. I think it lists you as like president or something, Eric. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think that's true. I don't think I ever did that. There was a question in there. Are there provisions for taking advantage of the added energy performance from automated sh and dynamic shading. There is something in the code about uh, how to deal with shading. But there's for how to deal with it, but I don't know that it's like, there's a provision that you have to do it. If you have automatic dynamic shading, you have to take the midpoint of the, uh, of the solar heat gain coefficient right. between light and dark. So thank you again, everyone. Good to see you here. And please reach out to us with your ideas, anything. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks so much, everybody. Patrick. Thanks.